All right, looks like I'm talking about my childhood games again. Mega Man X4 was my first Mega Man game. At least I think it was. It was either this or Battle Network 3. I don't remember which. I played them both around the same time. I'm not totally sure how I even ended up with X4. My one cousin had it and I liked it, so I guess my parents just bought it for me. My uncle that had the Xbox and Jeff Set Radio Future also bought me X5 at some point because he knew I liked X4. And you can tell he did his research because he didn't buy me X6. God bless his soul, he was a real one. As a kid, I never got very far in either of them. I beat Web Spider and Easy Glow once each, but that was it. I never even got past the intro stage of Zero because neither me nor my cousin could figure out how to hit him. It's not hard, by the way, it's the intro boss. I was like five, so it makes sense that I was so god awful at it, but my cousin had to be like 13 by that point. I don't know how he couldn't figure this out. I didn't actually end up finishing X4 until I was like 14, though. I think I tried playing it a year or two earlier when I found out that the PS3 Slim was fully backwards compatible with PS1, but not PS2. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, it's because it used the PS2 hardware to play PS2 games and emulated PS1 games. But I can play Nocturne and Bully on this thing just fine, so... what? <laughs> anyway, I didn't finish it at 12 or so, mainly because my PS1 disc is kind of broken and all the music sounds like this. X4's music is too good, I ain't playing it like that. So I was pretty excited when I got released on the PlayStation Store, which is when I finally finished the game, and at Zero no less, whom I couldn't even beat the intro stage with as a kid. Ever since then, X4 has been a game I usually come back to every now and then, usually finishing with both characters. So I'm like the other X games, I've already beaten X4 like 10 times. What can I say? I just have fun replaying it. I haven't played it since the X Legacy collection came out though, so it's been a while. But hey, what's two more times? Here's the weird thing about the PS1 trilogy for me. Despite X4 being my first with an asterisk Mega Man game, I actually prefer how the Super Nintendo games feel. I don't know what it is about these games. Something about the character sizes and general game feel just makes it ever so slightly not as good to me. That's not to say PS1 Mega Man X plays bad, it still plays pretty damn good. Just not quite as good as before in subtle ways that I can never truly put into words. Video games. Like, comment, and subscribe. <laughs> The presentation is definitely better, though. The jump from Super Nintendo to PS1 obviously let them make way more detailed sprites and animations. These games look great. It's wild that this was actually considered outdated when it came out. I get the 3D graphics are all shiny and new, but I just don't understand how you can look at this and think it looks bad. I mean, yeah, hindsight is 2020 and all that. I just never understood the logic. The game looks good. That's the important part. Like, apparently, Sony of America rejected the PS1 version twice just because it used 2D graphics. Graphics. It was a different time. And you know, it's pretty crazy just how little 3D effects it uses. The last few games had these wireframe models to show off their fancy graphics chip, and then when given a console capable of doing this natively, they just got rid of 3D effects entirely. Well, except for the boss explosions, but this was seriously the only 3D thing in this game that I noticed. None of this is a bad thing if it wasn't already obvious. I just thought it was pretty interesting that they pushed for an art direction they thought fit the game better instead of trying to chase trends. Although it could have just been because it was apparently developed as a Sega Saturn exclusive of all things. Yeah, there's a Saturn version for some reason. It's nearly identical to PS1 aside from a few minor graphical differences as far as I can tell. All the re-releases are based on the PS1 version anyway, so whatever. Doesn't really matter. As for the actual video game, let's start off with the stages. The stage stacks have a lot of variety this time. A jungle with waterfalls and logs they have to wall jump off of. There's a sky battalion, a frozen ice place. Oh hey, it's Blizzard Buffalo. That's a cool touch. I've always loved Cyber Peacock stage. It's a speed challenge, where on the first part of the stage, you get upgrades if you get through them fast enough. The real challenge comes from not touching these orange balls that slow you down. I am incredibly good at doing the exact wrong thing in this situation. You can easily get through the split mushrooms weapon, but it's a fun idea. The second half is kind of lame though, you just flip the stage and move balls around. They don't do anything interesting with it aside from using the ball to open doors or quickly defeating a few enemies. The split mushroom stage is kind of weird too, it has a few scenes like this where it's just a shifting panoramic staircase. It looks pretty bad compared to the rest of the game. Maybe it's just one of those things that look better on a CRT. Think Donkey Kong Country. You couldn't tell that the sprites were just pre-rendered 3D models because the display had its own inherent form of anti-aliasing. It's hard to show in an HD video like this, filters can't do it justice. Also, why do these staircases end with a teleporter? They can afford a teleporter, but not a door? <laughs> Honestly, most of the stages just kind of blend together for me. They're enjoyable, but I've played this game so many times that I can just fly through all of them without any issue. Most don't leave much of an impact on me anymore. It doesn't help that about halfway through each stage, you have a loading screen that refills all your health and ammo. And if you get a game over, you restart at the last loading screen instead of at the beginning of the stage. 
It was probably to cut back on load times, but you definitely feel the system limitations creeping up on you with the near instant load times on the Legacy Collection. I can appreciate the time save, but all it ends up doing is making live feel pointless. Not that that's a bad thing, it just puts the game on the easier side of the Mega Man X spectrum. X4 is hilariously forgiving. At least it means I don't have to play Jet Stingray Sage any longer than I have to. I don't know what they were thinking with this place. It's a rail shooter on this hover bike, and it's just so irritating. You can barely see two feet in front of you, and it comes down to memorization more than anything else. It's pretty short, but it's easily the only stage I outright hate playing. Although it probably wouldn't be as bad if this game was in 16x9 instead of 4x3. A really annoying thing about playing Genesis Sonic for me was the same issue. You go so fast in those games, you often ran into stuff you weren't careful. But since the remasters give you a wider field of view, it wasn't a problem for me anymore. The same principle might apply here, but even then, it would probably still be annoying and stupid and dumb anyway. I just can't do this anymore, man. Get me out of here. I missed Magra Dragoon stage. That was so much more fun. You get to beat up a boss in ride armor. That was awesome. The recommended first stage being in a volcano was pretty nifty. You don't see that too often in games. I really don't like the stage bosses, though. A lot of them go into a very easy-to-dodge pattern when you hit them with their weakness. I feel like I'm starting to sound like a broken record complaining about this, but it's really bad in X4, at least when playing as X. The only boss that doesn't suffer from Spark Mandrel Syndrome is Web Spider, but even then, dude, it's pretty easy with just the buster when you get the pattern down, so you don't really need his weakness to beat him. Look, if I could beat this guy once when I was six, I'm sure you can, too. Some of the weapons are at least useful, but honestly, the charge shot is so good in this game, I usually forget forgot about the weapons. The game actually gives you a neat choice. There's two arm parts in this game. The normal ones let you store up four smaller charge shots. This is the objectively wrong choice because the other one that's slightly hidden gives you a charge shot that pierces through multiple enemies and it hits multiple times with a spark trail thing. I guess the trade-off of the weaker weapons this time is the head parts just straight up give you unlimited weapon energy as long as you don't charge them. This is the most baffling decision I've ever witnessed. I could see it doubling your weapon energy but giving you infinite? <laughs> like... That's too busted. At least it would be if the weapons were better. The lightning web gives you a wall to jump off of, which is really useful. And Twin Slasher shoots two shots diagonally in front of you. It's great for awkwardly placed enemies. Everything else sucks, though. The soul body is this weird replica of you that doesn't do much damage. It seems scientifically engineered to make Cyber Peacock stage easier and nothing else. Ground Hunter just shoots these Stingray shots that go along the ground. These are ground-based enemies, but you're usually better off just shooting them normally. The other weapons are just there. Rising Fire is too situational. Frost Tower is a weird shield thing that's good against like two bosses. Double Cyclone is hard to aim, and the aiming laser is a little too awkward on anything that isn't a boss. You get the Nova Strike with the armor parts, but it's only good for one use, so it's mostly useless. So yeah, the weapons are just kind of alright in this game. You're usually better off using the Buster. Which makes it all the weirder that you not only have infinite weapon ammo with the head parts, but you also have a weapon sub tank. And your ammo is full or you're stored on death or a loading screen, so you're absolutely swimming in weapon energy you will never use. That weapon sub tank is even more baffling since Zero doesn't have weapon energy for his abilities, aside from this one attack, but that refills by doing or taking damage. Speaking of him, I should probably go over how Zero plays. In X3, he was basically just an easy mode for most of the game, but he's a completely separate character now. They saw the Z-Saber that went criminally underused and turned Zero into a melee fighter. Instead of a buster, he has a three-hit combo and an air slash. Whenever X would get a new weapon, Zero gets a new technique, usually used with a triangle button and holding a direction on the D-pad. Magma Dragoon gives him an upwards air slash as an example. Considering Zero's more limited range, it's actually pretty good for attacking enemies at weird angles. Split Mushroom not only gives Zero a double jump, but also gives you a spinning air slash, which becomes your primary means of attack going forward. It's just that good. But aside from those two, Zero's weapons are just as meh as X's. I can't think of a single time I'd ever use the ice stabby thing over the regular attack, aside from Jet Stingray. Who, by the way, also needs Split Mushroom's double jump in order to hit him with his thing consistently. Otherwise, it seems like you have to wait for him to do his charging attack, which just makes him annoying to fight. But even with the double jump, if you mess up hitting him once, it has this weird domino effect where it becomes hard to get back into the off flow of fighting him. Most of Zero's bosses are kind of hard, to be honest. Web Spider gives this electric stab thing, but it has a painfully long startup time, and it can only be used on the ground, meaning you can't hit Split Mushroom with it unless it's during the one specific attack where he's on the ground. It's just irritating considering how easy he is his X. Some bosses also share weaknesses, weirdly enough. Like how Peacock and Walrus are both weak to the upper's fire slash. Also, I'm not saying the actual names of these techniques because I can't remember them for the life of me. Cool Enbu? 
Ryujin something? Like, look at these. You try remembering this. Some bosses are still pretty easy with their weakness. Mainly Cyber Peacock, Storm Owl, Frost Walrus, and Jet Stinger if you do it right. But I'd say about three still put up a fight. I didn't die at all during X Boss Rush, but I actually died like three times during Zeros. So yeah, Zero is basically the hard mode of this game. You'd think that a melee-only character would be an objectively worse way to play Jump and Shoot Man, but there's always been something about Zero's gameplay that feels more satisfying than X. When having such low range, you need to pick and choose when to attack, especially on bosses. Like, when you fight the General's X, you can literally just stand in the corner and spam the Twin Slasher until he's dead. He can't really do anything to you. But when you fight him as Zero, it's much more tense because of how little opportunity you have to attack him. You have to just pray that he keeps using this lower charge attack instead of going uppers and sending out his rocket fist. Getting into position to attack him also trying to avoid these energy spheres isn't easy. Hitting him while he's lower to the ground is pretty doable. It's an extra layer of skill that you don't really see when you just hug a wall and attack from a distance. This general fight at zero is probably the only fun part of the ending game, though. It's an easy stage followed by a pretty easy stage, then it's just the boss rush and the final boss. Kinda lame, but I do like how stage two has a split path. I've always liked going down the paths as different characters just to spice things up. Honestly, my only big issue with X4 is the final boss. It's kind of overkill. The first phase is pretty easy. You use Rising Fire, Upper's Fire Slash on him, and every three phases he does this rush thing with a scythe. Like, once you get the pattern down, it's really hard to even get hit by this guy. Phase 2 is much worse just because Sigma's attacks can be pretty hard to dodge. It's mainly these boomerang things that hone in on you. You can't stand on the ground because Sigma's scythe is sending out these shock waves, but he can't hug the wall either because the boomerangs come after you. As X, I can never figure out how to dodge it consistently. I guess you can just slide down the wall at just the right time, but I couldn't figure it out. This attack is way less problematic as zero since you can double jump at the right time to get them off you, but I can still take a few tries to get it right. He also has his other attack where he shoots lasers at the floor and electrocutes the opposite wall, but he uses it so infrequently that it catches me off guard more than anything. Also, phases two and three technically have weaknesses, but I just ended up using the charge shot instead. It often gave me more consistent results, especially with phase two. The lightning web just ends up getting in the way more often than not. If the boss ended at phase two, it'd be pretty easy, but the third phase is where they really overdid everything. Everything. They at least have the decency to give you a health pickup, but it's not enough. So for this phase, you essentially have to take on two bosses at once. There's a giant Sigma head on the ground and a sniper Sigma on the wall that alternates between these colored statues attacking you. It's madness how much you have to worry about at once. Each boss only has like two attacks that are pretty easy to figure out once you get the hang of it, but it takes so long to get to that point that it makes this whole three-phase boss a giant endurance test. This is made worse by the fact there's only two sub-tanks in this game for some reason. Like, I kinda agree that X4 is easy enough to where you don't quite need four sub-tanks, but why the hell do you have a weapon sub-tank? In a game where you have an upgrade that gives you unlimited weapon ammo. And even if you did have three sub-tanks, you still have to make it count because you can't refill your tanks in between attempts. There was a loading screen right before this fight, so lives don't matter anymore. You can retry the boss as many times as you need to. But the only way to refill your tanks against this thing is to continually die over and over until they're refilled, which takes forever. It's shocking how big of an oversight this is. Why even make the player do this? Why not have a special item that appears only in this room that completely refills your tanks? Oh, but that'd make the game too easy. Then don't use sub tanks? Sorry that I want to consistently have a fighting chance to beat this guy within a reasonable time frame in a game that I otherwise never have any issues playing. Skill issue. Yeah, well, you want to know how I end up beating this stupid boss? I just throw myself at the fight and keep fighting him until I eventually win without sub tanks, or at least a half filled one because I wasted my tanks earlier and died right before the finish line. When you keep fighting this dude ad nauseum, you'll win eventually. It's just annoying that I have to do that when the obvious solution in this is to either replace the weapon sub-tank with a health sub-tank, or let you instantly refill them before the fight. I'd also adjust the vacuum attack on the Sigma head, at least when you fight him at zero. This thing does way too much damage and is so difficult to dodge. There's no way to consistently hit this stupid head at zero since it'll just blow you away otherwise. I think all he can really do is zero is to hug the top right corner and not even attempt to attack him, but it's just stupid and waste your time at that point. Like I said, this boss is doable. Its real issue is how you don't have a way to consistently refill your sub tanks, because that's kind of the point of them, to make bosses less taxing. Again, I shouldn't have to throw myself at the boss for an hour. It's boring. I'd rather just move on with my life. Which at this point is what I also rather do when it comes to talking about it. X1 Sigma ain't got shit on this guy. 
You know, I just realized I haven't talked about the story yet. Normally, I talk about the story in games first, mainly because it's a really easy icebreaker. If you're trying to talk to a friend about a game, it's like, well, what's this thing even about? Mega Man X4 is an interesting case. I could tell you anything about what happened in this game, but you already know what it's famous for. Ah! No, this isn't happening. There's no reason for me to go on. What? What am I fighting for? So why even bother leading with it? X4 is an occasional anime cutscene. The animation's fine. If you watch them on mute, it's about on par for what you expect from 90s anime. But when you listen to the English dub, it's completely butchered. It doesn't matter how good the writing is. If the acting is abysmal, you can't take it seriously. Just think about those Google translated mods that completely obliterate the in-game text. You can make anything sound stupid and hilarious, but the wrong word choice or bad delivery. Like in that same infamous scene I just showed, Iris' dying words are talking about how her and Zero should just run away together to a world where reploids can just live in peace without humans. Zero having a mental breakdown is completely justified. If my cute robot GF died in my arms, that question of life was worth living too. Like, for how much X4 is praised for being arguably the best X game in a series where his competition is Mega Man X, it's also constantly made fun of for his atrocious voice acting. I'm not even gonna bother ragging on X4's English dub. It's not just beating a dead horse, it's practically dancing on his ashes. It's so insane to me that X4 came out the same year as Mega Man Legends. The same publisher and same series of video games gave us some of the best voice acting on the PlayStation and some of the worst in the same year. You can easily tell where the voice acting budget went. There's this bizarre disconnect between the text cutscenes and the animated ones. Because to someone who's never looked into it, never tried to look at X4's story any deeper than what's presented by this atrocious English dub, the story's pretty bad. But the reality is that X4's story is actually pretty good. It's obviously no Shakespeare, and it's not even that deep, but compared to what came before, it definitely feels more well thought out and better written. So I'm just gonna be talking about the story assuming you watch the Japanese dub with English subtitles. Yeah, I'm being one of those people today. The game starts off with an alert that a group of Mavericks are attacking the Sky Lagoon place, and X slash Zero has to go stop them. Let's assume it's X for now. X actually doesn't make it on time, and the floating island crashes into the city below. Repliforce, a military group of Reploids, gets blamed for this whole mess because they just happen to be in the area. And because they didn't do it, their colonel refuses to cooperate, so they're labeled as Mavericks, and now they want to create a Reploid-only nation in space. So they have to beat up eight of their commanders before taking the fight to the space colony. Well, five of them. Magma Dragoon, Split Mushroom, and Cyber Peacock are actually working for Sigma. Split Mushroom even says, take a wild guess at who he's working for. Like, you know the drill, you know Sigma's behind everything. Bosses Legion is actually on their health bar. It's a great touch. It later turns out Magma Dragoon blew up Sky Lagoon just to fight X. Like, I know Sigma showed up and convinced them to do it, but surely Dragoon could have come up with some other way to fight him, right? X is a pacifist, sure, but I don't know, man. It seems a bit odd this dude would agree to kill tons of innocents just to fight one guy. Like, was he having a mid-life crisis or something? You can't just go on a murder spree in order to fight the main protagonist. You're not Vegeta. God, what was I even talking about? Oh yeah, the Mavericks. The other two Sigma Mavericks are basically just terrorists, but the Rebel Force Mavericks don't seem outright evil. Most of them just fight you out of self-defense. Hell, Frost Walrus doesn't even want to fight X because he doesn't want to hurt a kid. Even though Frost Walrus is probably younger than X because all Repoys are based off of X, but whatever. You do end up defeating Rebel Force in the end, but it's a pretty hollow victory. Aside from giving their space colony a giant death ray for some reason, they didn't really do anything wrong. Magma Dragoon was a soldier of Rebel Force, yeah, but they didn't order him to do that. He chose to destroy Sky Lagoon. Sigma ultimately ends up being behind everything. It's Mega Man X, what did you expect? It really goes to show how evil this guy is. He started a completely pointless war for literally no reason. You know all those monologues X has of the end of every X game? It feels like justified thoughts to have this time. No one had to fight, no one had to die. Repl Force probably could have even had their space colony peacefully if Sigma hadn't stepped in. It's a genuine tragedy. Zero's story plays out basically the same. Zero ends up rescuing the Colonel's sister, Iris, instead of Colonel, and Zero fights Colonel on a cutscene instead of as a mid-boss. Zero also ends up fighting Iris, but I don't know why. In the English version, she sounds sad more than anything. But in the Japanese version, she sounds a lot angrier, like how she told Zero way too many times not to fight Colonel and that it's too late for apologies. You know what, I think this game just had a botched localization in general. So I guess she's angry that Zero killed her brother, even though Zero didn't want to fight him in the first place. He more or less had to. It's a complicated situation, which makes Iris' death so much more tragic. Zero ended up having to kill the person he was trying to protect, so what's even the point in fighting anymore? 
That's what this scene was trying to say. It also turns out that Zero is not only created by Dr. Wily, but he also used to be Maverick. And it's implied that Zero's initial fight with Sigma is what caused Sigma to go Maverick. So something like 30 to 50 years after his death, Dr. Wily is low-key still the cause of everything wrong with this universe. And so, this game ends on Zero feeling ashamed of not being able to save anyone, while X asks Zero to dispose him if he ever goes Maverick. A really downer ending, no matter who you play as. It's kind of a shame how interesting of a story X4 has. It's pretty simple and not overly deep, but they really did try to do something more than the usual beat up Sigma kind of narrative. It's just that most people playing the game completely just miss it because of the bad localization. Like, I was talking to a few friends about X4 while editing this video, and they all thought the story was bad. Believe me, I'm forcing them to watch this. You know who you are. But sure, the story probably could have been told better. I didn't really get the full picture until I wrote this review, but I'm glad I did. I'm obviously not playing Mega Man for the story, but because of it, I ended up appreciating X4 more as I got older. I didn't actually finish this game for the first time till I was like 14. And to be fair, I didn't really pay attention to the story the first time I played. You know why. It just makes me wish more people could appreciate this plot. I feel really bad for everyone by the end. No one deserved any of this. None of it had to happen if Sigma stopped being an asshole for five minutes. It's all stuff I never thought about until recently. So yeah, Mega Man X4 is not my favorite Mega Man game, but it is my favorite X game. Everything about this game just comes together into an insanely satisfying package. It's more of a return to form for Mega Man X and doesn't experiment much like X2 and X3 did, but it ends up being a lot better as a result. Instead of trying something new, they polished and expanded on what worked. Even coming up with a new playable character that's somehow more fun to play as than Mr. Man himself. But that's mostly stuff you've probably heard before. X4 is considered one of the best games in the franchise for a reason. It kicks ass. I just wish more people could see the whole picture and appreciate the story this time. Obviously the English dub sucks and it's still pretty simple, but it does end up making you feel for all the characters when you really try to enjoy it. Mega Man is one of those games that doesn't need a story. I'm satisfied just playing through it even without any dialogue. But X4 is an example of how much better the experience can be when they try to make a more compelling narrative. Though we live in a society monologue at the end actually means something this time. It makes everything that happens have a purpose. Mega Man X is really about the tragedies of war and terrorism at the end of the day. But that the message feels forced if you don't do anything with it. X4 does. Even if the English translation is much to be desired. But does Mega Man X continue down this more mature road? I actually don't know. I haven't played X5 since I was 12, and I don't think I even finished it. I watched Let's Plays of all these games back when I was like 15 or 16, but I don't remember the stories of these games at all from here on out. So let's find out together. Till then, it's been fun. Take care, everyone.